welcome to The Feast Life, where we empower you, the modern homeschool mom, to create a life and homeschool you love. One founded on faith, family, freedom, and fun. I'm your host, Julie Ross, creator of the award-winning homeschool curriculum, A Gentle Feast, and a certified Christian life coach. For more information on today's episode and to access my free gift for you, check out thefeastlife.me. Charlotte Mason once said, life should be all living, not a mere tedious passing of time. So on this show, we seek to savor the feast of life. Girl, grab your favorite beverage and pull up a chair. You are welcome at this table. Hey, Julie Ross here. Welcome back to The Feast Life. On today's episode, I'm going to be talking about one of the most nourishing practices that I've used in my homeschool, and that is the concept of morning time. And I know a lot of you are probably familiar with this term already, but hopefully in today's episode, I'm going to be able to give you some more background on the different components of morning time and why they're so important to include in your homeschool and perhaps give you some new ideas of things you can incorporate into your morning time. And if it's not a practice that you've done consistently, maybe this episode will give you um, the encouragement that you need to get started. So just to give you a little background, I did not start off doing morning time when I first started homeschooling. Our mornings were very chaotic to say the least. I didn't really know how to start school in a way that would bring everybody together, that would bring um, order and calmness to the start of our days. Most days were started with me crawling out of bed in the mornings because the baby was crying or my older kids were fighting or any number of things that aren't really great things to be woken up to. I did not have my own morning routine and I'll talk about that in a different episode. I would just wake up when I needed to. So that created a lot of chaos already to start the day because I was already like not in a good mood. (laughs) And my kids didn't know what to do with themselves in the morning. Every day just kind of felt different. No day really had any kind of routine and structure. And then we would just start school as I was feeding the baby or running around doing these kind of things, trying to get some chores done, trying to get kids started and felt like I was pulling teeth most mornings. I once heard a homeschool speaker say that you should start your day off with the subject that's the hardest because in the morning, you know, your brain is the most fresh. So you should start with the subject that, you know, is difficult for most people that is math. So I started off my school age children when we first started homeschooling doing math at first and of course there was resistance of course it was really hard to get a rhythm and a start to our day it dawned on me at one point that it would be the equivalent of someone handing me a mop the minute i woke up in the morning and said okay julie now it's time to mop the floor because mopping the floors is like my least favorite chore i do not like mopping the floors of someone every morning I was greeted with, oh, because you're fresh and you're awake, now let's do the thing you really don't like. I would probably crawl back in bed and pull the covers up. I definitely would resist and not really have the best attitude about having to start my day with mopping the floor. It dawned on me that that was what I was doing to my school-aged children by trying to start school with math first. I really wanted to come up with a different way. And I started doing singing in the morning. I started having like a song that would bring all of us to the table in the morning and started bringing the little ones with us. So it was more of a family thing and not like, let me distract the toddlers while I do morning time with my school kids and they feel isolated and they're constantly interrupting us. Let's just do something all together. And this term morning time wasn't actually a thing. I was calling it circle time because I used to teach kindergarten and it was just this basic idea of let's start our day with a song, with a story. I have to admit, I was a little kindergarten teacherish, and we would do the calendar time and say the pledge and do that kind of thing. But it was a much better way to start our day. And then this term of morning time became more and more popular and more and more people were talking about it. And as I started diving into Charlotte Mason's volumes, she didn't use morning time. <laughs> I started realizing that some of the subjects that she did include in her programs really would fit well in morning time when we're all together as a family and we could start our day with things that are good and true and beautiful. I'm going to unpack 
some of the things that we include in our morning time, explain some of the neuroscience about why those are good subjects to include, what those do to your children's in your brain in the mornings to prepare you for learning. So let's dive into today's episode. All right, Charlotte Mason said, education is an atmosphere and a discipline and a life. The practice of morning time really does incorporate these three tools. One, it helps you make the atmosphere of your home in the mornings more calm, more lovely, more beautiful. It creates a discipline, it creates a habit, something that you know is going to happen every morning. There's not as much resistance, there's not as much decision fatigue of trying to figure out what we're doing. This is just what we do. And it becomes a habit, which makes things so much easier in your family when you have these good habits and routines in place. Then morning time is the perfect way to bring living ideas into your homeschool. And we'll talk about some of these with the different components. So it brings in that concept that education is a life. All right, I love this quote from Susan Schaefer McCauley. who wrote the book For the Children's Sake. She says, routines form habits. Children love routines. It frees their attention for the activity at hand. When planning routines, priority must be given to the important things. There is too much work to be done and I am finite. I need to accept that reality and plan the time and priorities carefully. So there's always going to be more things that we want to do in our homeschool. There's always going to be more things that we want to include. Making these things your priority first thing in the morning really does make sure that they get done. And it's not just like, oh, it would be nice to do some of these extra things every once in a while. Doing them in the morning has a greater probability that those priorities are going to get covered in your day. And hopefully after today's episode, you will want to continue with morning time and see the value of these subjects. It also forms habits. So you're, again, your kids know what is coming in the mornings. It lessens some of that resistance that they may have towards starting school. Once it becomes a habit, there's not so much thinking and training of your will to want to do it because it's a habit, it's a routine. And so fitting that into morning time really does help. Victor Hugo said, where no plan is laid, where the disposal of time is surrendered merely to the chance of incident, chaos will soon reign. So when you start your day and you don't have a plan and you don't have a routine, it takes about 30 seconds from your kids waking up for chaos to start to reign. Can I get an amen, right? We want to have a plan. We want to have a routine. We want to have some structure to how we're starting our school day so that chaos doesn't take over as soon as everyone gets awake in the mornings. Charlotte Mason said, it is not too much to say that a morning in which a child receives no new idea is a morning wasted. However closely the little student has been kept at his books. You can have them complete all their math lessons and do these different activities for these different subjects. But if they have not received a new and living idea that is gonna grow and shape them as a person, it's a morning wasted. So that's some pretty powerful words. It is so vital and important to have time where we're filling them with these beautiful ideas. This isn't a waste of time. And I hear that from people all the time, like, well, this is kind of extra stuff. And hopefully as you see through this episode, you realize that it's not. So even if you're just starting off your morning together and you're reading the Bible for five minutes, they're getting so much living word put into them and so much new ideas put into them. And that is such a great way to start your day. Even if you don't end up doing any of these other subjects. Just start together with something. What do I include in morning time? So again, this is not a prescription. You need to decide what's important to your family that you want to include in morning time. So I'm just going to share some of the things that I include that come from some of the subjects that Charlotte Mason included in her programs and some of the neuroscience behind these subjects but you need to decide what you want to include in your morning time and what works good for your family. I think the key in deciding what to include is you want to keep morning time not to a million minutes long, (laughs) okay? Sometimes it can be very tempting since we're all together. We're gonna do this and we're gonna do that. And before you know it, morning time takes to lunch. You want to keep it realistic. So what I do for our morning times is we do Bible and one other thing and we kind of rotate through what that other thing is so that morning time only lasts about 30 minutes. By then I've noticed people's attention has started to wane and we're ready to move on and start to cover some of the other subjects in our day to make sure that those get covered as well. So I just encourage you when you're thinking through what you do want to include in your morning time to try to limit it to about 30 minutes. All right, so what do I include? Singing, composer study, picture study, recitation, poetry study, 
read alouds, and these can be a lot of different things. Fables, folk tales are great for reading together all to a family when you have multiple ages. Shakespeare, biographies, but here's the key. I'm only doing these things about once a week. So like I said, it's Bible and one other thing. So this other thing kind of rotates through. So I'm not trying to do all of these subjects every day. That would take way longer than 30 minutes. I kind of rotate them through doing about one a week. All right, singing. Why do we include singing? So in Charlotte Mason's program, she included hymns, folk songs, and this concept, if you've never heard of it, it's called solfa. Solfa is a way to sight read music. And so she taught that as well. Again, you don't have to do all of these. Singing hymns, things that are important for how you worship as a family, are great to include. Folk songs, man, we had the best time learning folk songs. So I like to include folk songs that have to do with the time period that we're studying. If you have little children, you can include folk songs about the different seasons. Holiday time is a great time to learn some songs. It's very interesting. Some of the songs that I didn't think my kids were like are the ones that I find them singing around the house. Folk songs are just a really neat way to bring history to life. You hear what the common people are singing. So find some folk songs for what you're studying. Why do we do incorporate singing? Well, singing releases endorphins. Like Elf says in the movie, it's hard to be sad when you're singing, right? If you want Christmas cheer, sing out loud for all to hear. So when you're singing, you're usually like smiling and you're happy, right? So it makes you feel good to sing in the mornings. It also improves memory, so that's why you might not remember what you ate for breakfast today, but you can remember song lyrics from some song you learned when you were a child, right? So <laughs> singing definitely improves memory. That's why a lot of times we learn catchy songs for things that we want to memorize and learn as well. It strengthens the temporal lobes. So the temporal lobes are a part of the brain that is one of the last to deteriorate in old age. Again, so this is why you'll see people in like a nursing home and they might not remember their name, but they can, if they hear a song from when they were like a little child, they're gonna remember the words to it and they're gonna be able to sing it. Singing in the way that we are processing language stays in those temporal lobes, even if some of the rest of our memory starts to deteriorate, which is absolutely incredible. So just decide, like what are some songs that would be meaningful for your family and for how you worship or the historical time period that you're learning and sofa is really fun too there are plenty of youtube videos and lessons and i'll put some of these resources in the show notes if you want to teach your children how to read music by sight which is just a really great skill to have all right so composer study during composer study your child is learning about one composer charlotte mason had them do one composer per term she did three 12-week terms in a year. So you're learning about three composers throughout the course of a year. Then you want to pick about six of their popular pieces to listen to. You can find a biography about the composer on YouTube. Are there some great picture books about different composers available to read as well? So they just get some information about who this composer is and why they made the kind of music they did and when they were living, those kind of things. There's also a great podcast, Classics for Kids. And they have different composers, they have a biography about that composer, and then they have different podcast episodes teaching them different musical concepts based on that composer's popular pieces. So that is just a super easy way to start if you don't have any resources for composer study, they pretty much have done it for you. Just pick somebody and start working through those podcast episodes. Learning about a composer and listening to that classical orchestra kind of music increases dopamine, which is again, one of the feel good chemicals it decreases blood pressure. So even if you have like a crazy morning and you're running around and you're feeling very anxious, listening to classical music helps you calm down. It helps you relax. It takes away some of that stress for you and your children. And composer study also improves memory. Listening to classical music has been shown to help people study and remember the things they're studying more. Again, it's helping your child's brain get ready and improving their memory for the things that they're going to be learning throughout their day, which is super cool. Wendy Capar said, in music study, the same principles apply as in do picture study, nature study, and nature notebooks. That is the principle of attentiveness and good observation. The goal is not to have children who can give a lecture on music theory. So again, you don't have to know everything about the orchestra or that composer or music theory in order to do composer study with your children. Thank goodness, right? <laughs> the goal is not to have children who can give a lecture on music theory. It is to have children learn to enjoy classical music 
and tell one piece from another, just as naturally as they learn the difference between, say, the farmer in the dell and when the saints go marching in. Those are folk songs. Because they are both familiar with and fond of what they are hearing. The more they are exposed to good literature, the better they get at reading the themes and language of literature. In art and music, the more they're simply exposed to pictures and music, the more they learn to read the themes of the world's classical compositions. So you're exposing them. You're helping to train your child's affections towards the things that are beautiful and lovely. Listening to classical music in the mornings is a great way for them to learn to appreciate beautiful music. Today's episode is brought to you by A Gentle Feast. A Gentle Feast offers a complete living books curriculum, an award-winning early reading program, and more tools to equip you to apply Charlotte Mason's timeless philosophy into your modern homeschool. Go to agentlefeast.com to check it out. Smooth and easy days are closer than you think. Another way to help them appreciate beauty is through picture study. You're going to pick one artist per term, same as the, a composer, so you'll have three artists for the year, and then you're gonna pick about six of their popular pieces to learn about through the course of that term. Picture study is nearly the simplest thing ever, okay? What you do is you show your child a painting, like this painting right here. I would put it up for all my kids to see, and I'd have them look at it very intently, look in all the detail on this painting for about a minute, and then I would take the painting away, and I would say, describe what you saw. Tell me about the painting. And they're narrating back to you what they saw. Why? What does this do? What is the purpose of this? <laughs> well, like I said in the last quote, it's helping to train their affections for things that are beautiful. They have a better appreciation for beautiful art when they've seen beautiful art their entire life. It also stimulates both the unconscious and conscious brain functions. So it's helping to bring together these two brain functions of what's under the surface and what is their conscious thinking at the time. It increases a child's analytical and problem solving skills. So when they're looking at this painting and they're looking at all the details and then they're telling you about it, they have to have analytical reasoning to decide, okay, what was important? Oh, I wonder what that shape was or what was that thing really in the background? I'm not sure. Or was she wearing a red dress or a purple dress? They have to really hone in on the power of observation, which is going to be so important in other subjects like nature study or science or math, or even just reading good literature and being able to think critically about the themes that are in that story. Picture study helps them do that, and y'all, it takes about three minutes, okay? Oh, it's so easy and so simple to do. We try to overcomplicate some of these things and make them so hard, and we think we need to have a degree in art in order to teach our children about beautiful paintings, and that is not true. All we have to do is simply show them the painting and have our children look at it and then talk to us about it. I mean, it really can't get much simpler. Charlotte Mason said, we cannot measure the influence that one or another artist has upon the child's sense of beauty, upon his power of seeing, as in a picture, the common sights of life. He is enriched more than we know in having really looked at even a single painting. But think of this. If you do six over the course of a year, they'll have 18 paintings in the back of their mind. We don't know the influence that will have, the beautiful art will have on them as they see the world, as they interact with people, as they become creative adults who make and do beautiful things as well. Again, so simple, but so important. All right, poet study. So just like an artist and a composer, you're going to pick a poet to study each term. Then you're gonna pick about six to 12 of their popular pieces to read to your children. The goal of this is not to analyze the poem and break the poem apart and look at like, does it have iambic pentameter and what's the rhyming scheme and what's this vocabulary word and imagery saying? No, it's not to analyze. Thank goodness, right? So you don't have to be an English major to read and study beautiful poetry with your children. The goal again is to expose, expose them to beautiful language. Develop their imaginations because poetry is such metaphorical and such beautiful language that it brings pictures into your children's minds and they can see different things. So what did this poem, what were you seeing in your head while we were reading this poem? Oh, this poem made me think about blah, 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 blah. Oh, wow, isn't that neat? I think that, that word really there 
when they're talking about the tree whispering. Oh, have you ever heard that when we're out in nature? Like a tree kind of sounds like it's whispering, doesn't it? So many cool things to talk about in these beautiful poems. You're just giving them the delight that poetry can be. If you want to kill your children's love for poetry, make them start to analyze it. So we don't want to do that. We want to foster their love for poetry and beautiful language. Charlotte Mason loved this so much, you know, that she wrote volumes of poetry based on the Gospels. And they're so beautiful and so rich to read. It's just a neat way to kind of read some of the Gospel stories. You never know what this beautiful poetry might do for your child. So while you're reading poetry to your child, it lights up the emotional centers of the brain. Poetry invokes emotion. Sometimes poems are just silly and fun. And sometimes poems, they're hard, right? And they talk about the hard things of life and the hard emotions. It's helping build those emotional centers in your children's brain. It also develops complex reasoning. Again, because you're thinking through some of the metaphors, some of the imagery, you're thinking on a much deeper level than just basic critical recall of reading a sentence like Susie likes to go to the park. <laughs> reading poetry, you're kind of having to think about what the meaning is and what might be there. Again, not to analyze it, but just to develop that habit of thinking more critically. This is an article from the Parents Review that Charlotte Mason edited. It's written by Mrs. J.G. Simpson. She wrote, you must read our poets and learn them by heart till our minds are full of the best thoughts and loveliest expressions that the world has yet uttered. And be sure that as we read and learn, our own appreciation will grow. And we shall begin to understand more fully why we must teach our little ones what is good and why we are doing them a real wrong if we let their minds be filled with what is poor and trivial. Why all the world's rich treasures are lying ready for them to take and use as their own possessions. Poetry really is beautiful. I think we can sometimes think that this is a waste of time or our kids might not like it or they might not understand it or they might think these things sound weird. You don't know the influence that this is going to have on your child. And again, we're training their affection. So if they're used to reading kind of more silly, trivial things, hearing poetry is going to sound really bizarre and really complicated. Have patience with it and trust the process and be encouraged that it will not be a waste of time ever to expose your children to what is good and true and beautiful. Another thing I include in our morning time is recitation. So recitation is when your child has a poem, a speech, or a section of a play, and they're going to read it out loud for several weeks. So you can choose a poem for them. You can have them pick one if they're older. You can find speeches that have to do with the history time period that you're reading with. So maybe like the Gettysburg Address or Martin Luther King Jr.'s I Have a Dream speech or a section of a play for reading through Shakespeare. And your child's going to read that out loud for several weeks. So the goal of this is not to memorize the poem or the speech. It is to speak with elocution. So this would have been something that was very popular in Charlotte Mason's time period, you know, before TikTok and TV. You would have speakers come and teach about things that they knew about, but you would also have them come recite famous speeches, famous parts of a play, famous poems. If you've ever seen um, Anne of Green Gables, where, you know, she wins a prize for reciting this beautiful poem. So it would have been a thing that people would have done. The reason why recitation is still so important is because recitation builds public speaking skills. So Charlotte Mason, even though she lived over 100 years ago, said, I hope that my readers will train their children in the art of recitation. In the coming days, more even than in our own, it will behoove every educated man and woman to be able to speak effectively in public. And in learning to recite, you learn to speak. So by having your child read a poem out loud every week, or a speech, or a section of a play, teaching them how to speak with elocution and enunciate and have emotion in the way that they're talking. That is a skill that is going to help them through their entire life. So Charlotte Mason wrote that over a hundred years ago. How much more important is that in today's world to be able to speak where video is everything, right? <laughs> it doesn't matter if you are a farmer or a CEO, you need to be able to speak in public, whether you're making Instagram reels or you're giving a keynote address for thousands of people. The ability to speak in public is one that is going to help your children immensely in their life. And recitation, again, in just a few minutes a week 
is going to help them build that skill as well. Okay, and then another thing we do to kind of include in our morning time is read aloud. So again, there's lots of different things you can include. I just love it because it's a way to bring beautiful stories into our day when we're still all together as a family. So this can be fables are great for little ones to learn how to narrate. They're very short. Fairy tales build imagination and children love those. Shakespeare is something great to read all together as a family. A biography of someone that you're learning about in history. Seasonal picture books are wonderful if you have little ones that you can all read together as well. So we know about the benefits of reading aloud to our kids. Reading aloud helps connect neurons in their brain, helps deepen the neural pathways that are going to help make connections amongst different ideas and help enrich their learning and understanding of those different subjects. The more connections we make and the deeper those connections are, the stronger those neural pathways are. It also releases oxytocin, which is the bonding chemical. So when you're reading aloud to your kids, you're building a bond together as a family but it's also helping your children bond to the people in the stories and they feel like they are in that character's shoes. It helps them build empathy and understand humanity better. Reading aloud also develops sequential reasoning. So you read your child a fable, like the tortoise and the hare, for instance, and then your child tells back to you or narrates what it was about. They have to have sequential reasoning and start to learn how to put the pieces of the story together, okay? Did it start with the story being where the rabbit won? No, okay? There was a tortoise, there was a hare, the hare challenges the tortoise to race, you know, what comes next? They have to develop that reasoning skill. Reading aloud also increases cognitive function. So, so many different parts of your brain are working when someone is reading aloud to you and it strengthens those areas of your brain to work in different ways. So, all these things to say that morning time is not a waste of time. <laughs> It is, in just 30 minutes a day, preparing your child for all the learning that's coming next. So not only is it shaping them as a person by filling their minds and training their affections with what is true and good and beautiful, it's also helping their brain get ready for the rest of the things that you're doing in the day. So it is not a waste of time. <laughs> it's helping improve their memory. It's helping increase their cognitive functions. It's helping them develop complex reasoning that they're going to use in the other subjects throughout the day. It's helping build their memory skills. It's also bonding you all together and just creates such a special time that you guys get to share together. So Cindy Rollins is the one who kind of pioneered this term morning time. I'm not even sure when that was. I'm, get, I'm thinking it was like over 10 years ago from what I recall. But in her book, Mere Motherhood, this is what she has to say about morning time. It is a liturgy. It is a habit that ties the past to the future, a liturgy of love. Morning time is a way to collect little grains of sand. It should not be a way to complicate life, but to simplify it. So if you've tried to do morning time before and you're like, we just couldn't do it. It was so complicated. You do, it doesn't have to be. You're overcomplicating it. We, it is very, very simple. If you stick to one or two things a day and keep to some of these simple things that I talked about. If you have something that you want your children to assimilate, like poetry or scripture or music or Shakespeare, forget the grand schemes. Forget what the mom is doing down the street. Start giving that thing one or two minutes of your time daily and watch the years roll by. For me, the years did roll by and they are rolling by for you. You are never going to have a lot of time. But you do have a little time here and a little time there, and those little times all add up to a life. Charlotte Mason said that education is an atmosphere, a discipline, and a life. Those words precisely describe morning time and why I think it is a perfect way to pull together a Charlotte Mason education. So, I think it's so key what Cindy said here. If there is something that you want to include in your homeschool that you think is important, she says you only have to give it one or two minutes a day and watch the years roll by. So again, it doesn't have to take up your whole day. Just a few minutes, just five minutes of picture study. Five minutes of listening to a beautiful composer's classical music. Five minutes of singing a song together. But watch the years go by and see the difference it makes. We're never going to have a lot of time. So it's a little time here and a little time there. And all these seeds of these living ideas are going to take root in your child's mind. And they're going to shape who they are as a person. 
So, I have a free gift that I would love to give all of you for listening to The Feast Life. If you want help planning out your morning time or figuring out what even to include in morning time, I have a free four-week morning time packet. It's called Times of Togetherness, so all the art and the composers and the poetry are focused on doing things together as a family and building that connection and that bond, which will really help you kind of start this routine or jump start it again if you've kind of fallen out of it. I also include some fun things in here that are just extras. I wouldn't do them during morning time. Save those for later in the day or when you have extra time on the weekends, but there are some cooking and some fun kind of craft things that you could do together all as a family. So if you go to thefeastlife.me, and scroll down to the bottom, you'll see a place to get this free morning time packet that I have made for you so that you can get started on this practice of morning time. I hope today's episode has encouraged you to delve into some of these subjects that you might want to include in your morning time. I hope you've seen the value that including these subjects will help transform your child's education, it will help grow their brain in so many different ways that will prepare them for the learning that they're going to do throughout the day. But I also want to make this very last point. Morning time changed me by reading beautiful poetry in the morning, by reading beautiful stories, by having our Bible time together. I went from having mornings that were chaotic and stressful and everybody is in a bad mood (laughs) Two mornings where our routine just flowed and everyone got up and we're ready to start our day. And I'm excited to get out of bed in the morning and start our homeschool because I know that we're going to be doing things that feed my heart and my mind and my soul. I started craving morning time because it was changing my affections. And when I saw how it was changing my affections, that encouraged me so much to keep this practice going with my family because I knew that it would change their affections and change their hearts as well. There was a time about four years ago, my family was going through a really hard time and the morning time packet from a gentle feast that we were using for that cycle, the memory verse that we were doing was Ephesians and the armor of God. And so every day we would read and um, recite that passage together. And it was exactly what we all needed for the hard time that we were going through and we'd visualize ourselves putting on this armor of God in the mornings. Our read aloud for that time was Heidi and the sweet story of this little poor Swiss girl and the challenges that she was facing. There would be literally times I would be crying during our read aloud because it was so touching to me and encouraging to me to see this little girl in this story's faith. And it encouraged me to have more faith for what our family were going through. And the hymn that we were doing then, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. And it was just so perfect for what our family needed at that time. And so I hope this episode has encouraged you to dive back into morning time to consider what things you might want to include in morning time for your family and to build this routine that is really going to nourish all of you. Thank you so much for listening. Until next time, remember, life's a feast. Let's savor it. here. I just wanted to say thank you for listening to today's episode. If you like this show, it would mean the world to me if you would leave a positive review in iTunes. This really does help people learn about the podcast. And each month I will pick a winner to receive a free gift. Don't forget to check out all the free resources we created for you at thefeastlife.me. Thank you.